When you hear Donald Trump evoke Nazi rhetoric time and time again, with little to no mention in the media, what goes through your mind when you see the media focused on President Biden's memory? Yeah, I mean, it's it's crazy. I mean, look, I think the, the contrast couldn't be more clear, first of all. I think it's been made just crystal clear in just in the last 24 hours. Uh, President Biden has been completely cleared, no conviction. He's done nothing wrong in this case. There's been no evidence that's brought against him. Uh, he, you know, Of course, we know that this has been politically motivated, maybe to try to score some political points uh, on, on the part of the special counsel, but he's been cleared. That is the story. That is in sharp contrast to someone who hid documents, uh, would not work with the Justice Department, actually is now being indicted on serious federal counts for his mishandling of classified documents. And so the, the choice is very clear. I mean, just tonight, and Jonathan, you know this, Donald Trump made, I think, dozens of lies and mistakes uh, on in his speech earlier today. Uh, that, I doubt, is going to be on the front page of The New York Times tomorrow. Uh, Joe Biden is ready. He's been a great president. I'm around him often. He knows he knows what's go what's going on. He is bright. He's engaged. I am so grateful that we have someone with so much wisdom, strength, and experience as the president. And we're going to work hard every single day to make sure he gets reelected this November. And meanwhile, here's what your colleague in the House, Republican Congresswoman Elise Stefanik, said yesterday when asked what she would have done on January 6th. I would not have done what Mike Pence did. I don't think that was the right approach. Uh, Congressman Garcia, can you explain the problem with those words from Congresswoman Stefanik? I, I mean, first, let's speak. I mean, Elise Stefanik, like many others in Congress, were hiding in the halls of Congress, in the gallery. We've seen the photos um, because she was scared for her life, as she should be. There were insurrectionists attacking the Capitol. And so what she's doing now is so shameful. We all know she is auditioning to be vice president uh, for Donald Trump. That is her entire mission in life right now is to try to get um, that nod from him. And I think it's, it, it's just so crazy that she has changed so much in such a short amount of time. She is obsessed with power uh, and with becoming the vice president and, and why anyone would want to be the VP uh, for someone um, who is uh, essentially probably going to go to jail and who has called essentially for the hanging of their former vice president um, is beyond me. And so um, I, I think she, she's really ashamed and even quite frankly should leave the House. No. Paul Krugman writes in The New York Times, and I'm quoting here, a significant faction of Republicans, Trump included, would prefer to block aid to Ukraine because, by all appearances, Vladimir Putin is their kind of guy, and they're content to see him steamroll his Democratic neighbor. Congressman, the, the Senate voted yesterday afternoon to advance a sweeping emergency aid bill for Ukraine and Israel. Are you hopeful it will not just pass in the House, but will actually get a vote in the House? I'm very hopeful that this gets a vote in the House. And, uh, and to be honest, we're unsure. I mean, at this point, um, the Speaker, Mike Johnson, might as well bend the knee to Putin. And it is completely embarrassing. We should be ashamed that so many members of our Congress have decided to turn their backs on democracy in Eastern Europe. They decided to turn their backs on standing up to an authoritarian, to a dictator, to someone that has caused enormous harm, not just to his own country, uh, but to Ukraine. We have to stand up for democracy in Ukraine. They are counting on us. And so I'm very hopeful that we can put this together, that a vote can come forward in the House. It's incredibly necessary. Um, but I, I'm not confident in Mike Johnson. I mean, Mike Johnson, I think, has proved to all of us that he can't control his caucus. He takes orders from Margie Taylor Greene and Matt Gates. And so I think, it's, I think we're going to wait to see what happens, but I'm hopeful that we can get a vote. The fake Biden robocall was a was a wake up, a concrete example of what bad actors could do. Do you feel you have the tools and resources to adequately protect Nevada's election this November? What do you tell Nevada voters? Yeah, first of all, thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here. You know, Nevada runs some of the most safest elections in the country. They're secure. We have accessibility. We have universal mail ballot. We have early voting. We have same day election centers. But when you talk about AI and some of the situation we saw in New Hampshire, it becomes concerning. We are dealing with so many issues and so many priorities given the state of elections today. 
And when you add AI and these types of issues on top of all of our other concerns, we are asking for help. You know, I, in constant communications with my colleagues and secretaries in Michigan and Arizona, and we had a deep conversation about that question. Are we prepared to handle the new threats of artificial intelligence or deep fakes into this process? And the answer really is we need to get better. We need to educate ourselves about what it means. We also, too, we need the help of the federal government. The federal government has the resources. They have the access to the experts to be able to help us better respond to these situations. We will make ourselves present. We will be able to respond to these issues. The challenge is bad information or misinformation is, and if it impacts whether a voter goes to the polls, that's the real harm, is taking a voter out of the process. You know, Secretary Aguilar, um, the new FCC ruling classifies these fake robocalls under the Consumer Protection Law. And the Boston Globe reports, I'm going to put this up, those who break the law can face steep fines with a maximum of more than $23,000 per call, the FCC said. The agency has previously used the consumer law to clamp down on robocallers interfering in, in elections, including imposing a $5 million fine on two conservative hoaxers for falsely warning people in predominantly black areas that voting by mail could heighten their risk of arrest, debt collection, and forced vaccination. Secretary, communities of, colors, of color are often targeted. We saw that in 16 and 20. In Nevada, are you also concerned about having to capture threats in Spanish language disinformation? Absolutely. That's my greatest concern. You know, being a member of our Latino community, <coughs> You know, we make up 30 percent of Nevada. They are a working force that makes sure the strip runs on a daily basis. And if we're not giving them access to the ballot box, we're not going to know the priorities of the Latino community to better build our community. And you talk about AI, you know, the, you have to talk about the bias that's going into the actual system. The data that AI is using does not include the perspective of our communities of color. And so we have to be able to address these issues. But also, too, you start talking about misinformation within the Latino community, especially in churches through WhatsApp. WhatsApp is a constant communication piece in our community and being able to use that forward button. Last night I was at an event with the Gwynn Center here in Reno and one of the research centers that focuses on Latino topics at the University of Nevada, Reno, talked about some of these issues and is trying to address these issues of what we need to do from a ground level to educate voters about these challenges. You know, trust is also a major part of election security. You've been meeting regularly with pastors and neighborhood groups to, to build that trust. Tell us about those conversations, and does that trust extend across party lines? It does. Look, you know, we have a Republican governor in our state. I'm constantly communicating about the importance he has as a member of the Republican Party to ensure that we're getting correct information to our communities. I enjoy the opportunity to talk with our pastors in the black community because they're trusted. And if I can leverage their trust to be able to educate voters about our process here in Nevada, that it is secure, it is safe to vote, and that your vote will be counted, we need you to vote. And it's showing up everywhere to be able to enforce this message. But also too, you know, our we have 17 election clerks across this state and 11 of them are new. So it's educating them about the process, it's educating them about the challenges that we have, but also making sure that they're present in our communities of color and having these conversations directly to them. One more question for you, Secretary. When it comes to election threats, what worries you the most? Look, elections are about the people. They're about the voters. They're about the candidates. And they're about the election workers. None of this works unless we have poll workers to work the polls. And in Nevada, we're struggling at the moment to make sure that people are there. You know, Clark County, where 70 percent of our voter base is, was able to use some very creative ways to get new poll workers into the process, looking at a younger volunteer and necessarily not volunteers. We do pay our poll workers, but it's in our rural communities where we're having a struggle getting people to show up at the polls because it's a hard, hard job. You know, we worked really hard to look at this cycle and be like, what do we need to do to prepare to make sure that election workers feel safe? Eighty percent of election workers are women. And if they don't feel safe, it becomes an issue not only for them, but their families. And so we made a huge push to educate the legislature and the governor on creating a safe place for election workers. We passed a bill to make it a felony to harass and intimidate election workers. We passed an anti-doxing bill. 
we are working really hard to ensure that they have the resources and the tools to do the job we need them to do. Poll workers are the unsung heroes of our democracy, and we need to respect them for what they do. It's not a Democrat or Republican issue. This is an issue about community and understanding that there is a human component to all of this. We are just a couple of weeks away from the two-year mark of Russia's invasion. Give us your sense of where things stand now. Well, the Ukrainians are very realistic about the, the prospects of uh, Donald Trump potentially coming back to the White House. Uh, this wouldn't be the first time President Zelensky has dealt with Trump. If you remember in 2019, oh, yeah. uh, the, the first impeachment of Donald Trump, uh, President Zelensky was, was a major actor there. So he, he understands what it will mean for Ukraine if Trump returns to the White House. And they are preparing for that eventuality if it happens by starting to produce their own weapons and, and pushing European allies to try to fill, to take up the slack if U.S. support continues to decline. But honestly, they need that American support. In all my conversations with them, they say that uh, there is no alternative to American leadership. According to one assessment, Ukraine only has enough air defenses to last until next month. What happens if those supplies run out before Congress takes action? I mean, the, Zelensky has been very clear on that. He said this in one of his most recent visits uh, last year to Capitol Hill. He was asked, what will happen if we don't give you the aid? And Zelensky told them, if, if America doesn't give us the aid, we will lose the war. Uh, I think it is still that stark, but still the Ukrainians are attempting to find other ways, developing their own homegrown air defense systems, looking to the Europeans for, for donated systems. So uh, they're, they're finding ways to fill the gaps. But, but again, you know, they need the Americans to come through on this. From my conversations with the Ukrainian leadership, uh, they are still surprisingly optimistic, I think, given how tight the deadlock is on Capitol Hill. They seem to believe that it will come through. Uh, maybe that's naive, but, but that's where they are. Well, I, you know, I, just this week, uh, the European Union approved a $54 billion aid package for Ukraine. Uh, what, other, what other options does Ukraine have for financial and military support if the United States doesn't come through, the $54 billion from the EU, where else could money come from? I mean, great question. Uh, one answer to that is, again, domestic production of weapons inside Ukraine. They've been ramping up and reviving a lot of their factories, many of them inherited from the Soviet Union, that have been derelict and mismanaged for many years, but they are now beginning to crank out the kind of weapons that Ukraine needs. But one thing that Zelensky has been asking of Biden is to give Ukraine the licenses, the technology, the blueprints to produce more American weaponry inside Ukraine. That is something that Biden could potentially do uh, without congressional approval. Uh, they would still need billions of dollars of aid and financial assistance to kickstart the, domest the domestic weapons industry. But I think that is one way that Biden could help potentially without uh, a congressional approval. You know, just, uh, I, I'm curious to get your take on Vladimir Putin's interview with Tucker Carson, Car Carlson. What does Putin hope to accomplish with that? I mean, I, I've heard this history lesson. I think it was a surprise to many uh, viewers to hear him rant this way for 40 minutes about ancient history. But this is the, the speech, the spiel he delivers to so many of his foreign guests this is the way he, uh, uh, in his mind, justifies the idea that all of Ukraine belongs to Russia. Uh, he's trying to, to deliver that message to the West. I, I think it, it showed a lot of um, just, just how detached he is from reality. If he understood anything about his audience, he could have talked about, you know, American uh, sort of conservative values to try to appeal to Trump's voter base. But instead, he took us back to the 9th century and the 13th century. I think it shows that he really doesn't have the kind of uh, understanding of the information war and the messaging that is required to, to get and keep American conservatives on his side. Uh, so that's that's uh, that's what I took away from it. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I can't let you go. I 
I'm, I'm sorry, I should have asked that question last um, instead of this one, because just this week, President Zelensky made a change at the top of Ukraine's military, removing the general who had been in charge since before the war even began. What does that move signal about the future of this conflict? Well, it was a long time coming. Uh, the tensions between those two men, the president and his top military commander, had been simmering for a long time behind the scenes. I think there's some hope that now that Zelensky has put in place uh, a more uh, a, a military leadership that he can work with more easily, um, there there may be it may become easier for him to adjust the strategy to uh, find a new approach to the the battlefield that will work better. I, th I think the tensions between the two men were really uh, dragging the country down in terms of finding a new approach uh, and being more nimble on the battlefield. At least that's the hope. I mean, it, it's still uh, not a good look to dismiss your main military commander in the middle of a war, but, but I think the tensions between the two men had, had come to a boiling point, so it needed to happen.